Hey friends, my name is Daniel McQueen and I'm making this video again to connect with my community, my student population and the larger community of Colorado and the larger psychedelic community of Colorado. I'd like to give some perspectives, my perspectives of the Natural Medicine Health Act and go into some of the detail but also name uh, what I intend to do uh, in this situation. I think it's important um, Please pardon any uh, roughness around the edges. I'm going to try to do this video in one take. So to introduce myself, uh, I think it's important to do that to provide some context to this conversation. I'm also want to just name straight up that I'm not choosing sides here or aligning with um, the opposing sides of this argument. And I am here to share my experience and my perspective only. So again, my name is Daniel McQueen, and I'm a professional psychedelic guide using a legal plant medicine here in Colorado. I developed a program uh, called Psychedelic Sitter School, where we teach people how to use uh, cannabis as a psychedelic. I also have a center here where we facilitate therapeutic sessions with cannabis, with clinical and spiritual practitioners. We also work with ketamine. Um, the debate on whether cannabis is a psychedelic can be another time. Uh, but I'll just say I've been doing this for with cannabis for nine years professionally. Uh, I can elicit experiences that are um, completely similar to psilocybin, MDMA, even DMT, ayahuasca. Um, I have a lot of videos and presentations and I wrote a book about how to use cannabis as a psychedelic. So I'm way past the issue of uh, is cannabis a psychedelic? And so if that's the case, then I've been practicing with a natural medicine legally in Colorado for the last nine years. And our program has been operational for over 10 now, almost 11. Um, just to give you an idea of our program, I have 19 psychedelic guides on my teams. Um, some are licensed counselors, some are ministers, um, yoga uh, therapist, uh, nurses. We have a medical doctor who's our medical director. Um, my wife is a licensed counselor and art therapist and our clinical director. Um, and we've been safely doing this for a very long time now um, with cannabis as a psychedelic. So a natural plant medicine and also with uh, ketamine uh, using that as a psychedelic tool. Um, also, want to say that um, it's been deeply inspiring to do this work and uh, and I am very privileged to do this work in this way. I want to honor and acknowledge the harm of the war on drugs and everybody who's been incarcerated with this medicine. I, I consider this an act of service to do this work and hold this place for others. Um, I've trained hundreds of students who are practicing with cannabis as a psychedelic all over the United States, um, all of Canada, um, and even we have international students now who are using this medicine. It's where it's legal. So uh, I just want to name, you know, I have um, a very rich psychedelic facilitator life and um, professional life, and uh, and it's been deeply beyond moving for me. So all the things you hear about psychedelics being a transformational tool spiritual tool and also for therapeutic use practices is all very real very legit and it's also very safe when used in the right container and with the right um, skill and intention and all of that um, so i just want to name that piece um, i wasn't really paying attention to the natural medicine health act primarily because i already in many ways live it um, but that was a mistake and i realized that um, not that long ago, I think it was in August, um, Allison, my wife and I came into the office one morning and after a big rain and our offices were completely flooded. It was this weird, you know, um, environmental climate change flooding event that we had and it messed us up in a good way <laughs> for a good month. We uh, had to move our furniture four times um, keep our practice going, keep our continuity of care going. 
Uh, we got beautiful new floors out of it. Um, the the building has been mitigated, so in a good way. It um, it uh, was hard, but we made it through it. Um, but I've been through situations that have been as um, difficult before with our program, and so from my perspective, it was as much a transpersonal or symbolic experience as it was just a freak accident. And the very first thing I asked myself was, okay, Daniel, you've been through this before. Um, you've been hit pretty hard uh, in situations before. What is the universe trying to tell you? It's usually something that you're not paying attention to. It's saying, wake up, pay attention. What are you missing? And the very first answer that came to me in my head was, I haven't been paying attention to the Natural Medicine Health Act. I knew it was coming, um, but again, I was just coming off of a beautiful retreat in Berkeley with a beautiful spiritual community using psychedelic cannabis. We were just about to step into other training programs. We were very, very full. We're a small organization and um, my activism is my work, you know, so I haven't been, I hadn't been paying attention to it. And that was a major mistake on my part. So I read it and I did a deep dive with it. And what I realized is that this was an existential situation for my program and my community. Um, so I've no, I haven't just read it now. I've deeply studied it. I, because of my work in the world, I work with lawyers all the time. Um, and even though it's difficult for me to understand some of the legal language, I do understand it. Um, and I have some experience with understanding things like this. I also want everybody to know here that I interviewed anybody I could about this, uh, the Natural Medicine Health Act on both sides of the concerns. I started with interviewing people on the decrim side who has expressed significant concerns about the bill and oppose it. I've also interviewed um, the lead um, activist on who are supporting and have initiated the measure. I've also interviewed a, a paid for legal um, uh, hours with uh, with the people who've written the bill so I can get their take on some of the questions that I had. I have lawyers that are friends of mine that I have reached out to and spoken to about this. Our own lawyer, um, who's an activist in the psychedelic community not associated with the Natural Medicine Health Act, um, has provided me his opinion on it. Um, and I've also reached out to um, a licensed counselor with decades of experience who has is an activist a political activist and has regularly engaged dora on regulatory issues um who else have i spoken to other activists have spoken to our community um and then i've read it myself like multiple times now all right so i've studied it um i've dialed i've dialed in all all the pieces so again, I'm not here to take size, sides um, with either the pro or against movements. I think that's a polarity that's false and that it's not a black and white issue and that uh, just anything related to psychedelics, it is extremely complicated. I also want to name that it appears that um, legalization in general, also legal questions, legal contracts, legal stuff, um, is real triggering to the psychedelic community because of the harm of prohibition and the war on drugs and that there's some um, there's some big feelings in this space which I totally get I feel them too uh, people on my team feel them um, and I also get the significant concerns some people in the psychedelic community have around uh, corporate interest in this movement so I again, I want to just say that I'm coming from my perspective here. Um, in some ways, this feels like um, unsafe to do, um, but I also feel completely ethically obligated to speak about this uh, for my community and the larger psychedelic community. And if I can help, um, you know, Colorado in any way, you know, that I hope I can have a voice for you as well. Um, so very briefly, I have some notes and I just want to name some of the things that it does just to clarify, um, what it does, what the act does. 
basically creates two pathways of uh, legal psychedelic medicine use. Um, there's the regulated side and then there's the personal use side, which is often referred to as the decriminalized side. But I think personal use is a better uh, name for it. Um, so on the regulated side, it allows uh, a pathway which is going to take at least a year or more through the Department of Regulatory Agencies, uh, which is called DORA in Colorado, to allow for facilitators to get um, credentialed in this work, training programs to be able to uh, teach, starting with psilocybin, but in the future, maybe other medicines, and then also something called healing centers. Okay, um, So I've reviewed the uh, requirements for the healing center, the training program, and facilitators. And I want you all to know, like if we if we work with the I, the the foundational assumption that cannabis is a psychedelic, cannabis is also a plant medicine. Therefore, it is um, by definition a natural medicine, uh, even though it's not covered under these uh, this act. Um, and if that's the case, my program already meets all of the requirements uh, for professional ethical. Uh, credential use of of psilocybin. We just have to adjust things as as the regulations come online um, uh, to do that. You know, and 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 we didn't do this overnight. It's taken ten years to get to this point. And I I agree. I have some concern concerns too about accessibility within this because I actually know how much it costs to set something up like this, and it will be out of the um, uh, the space of of. People, a lot of people like me being able to do this without consolidating a community around uh, to invest in it. Um, the, so one of the primary concerns is that corporations are going to take over the process. And I, I agree, there will be some of that. There will be companies coming in um, out, out of state who will attempt to start programs here. It's going to get a very, become a very crowded field very quickly. Um, but I just want to say, though, that it's not going to be just corporate interest um, uh, that that bring into this realm. I, you know, myself, we will be stepping into the regulatory process if it's passed and um, and engaging that practice. We're already doing it. So why wouldn't we? Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> there are some qu questions which I think are legitimate around like the use of donations for influence it's, it allows donations um you know uh within that to, to the regulatory program let's call in and, and fight for transparency if that's the case um i think there's there's plenty of spaces to hold people accountable who are donating into the program um and that these are conversations that will be an ongoing uh, engagement. This isn't the this this bill or act isn't the begin the end of the conversation. It's just the beginning. Um, I also agree with the decrim side that some of these corporate players are just not good people. Um, uh, there's just a, a particular worldview or paradigm that people from a corporate space live in that's in many ways incongruent with the psychedelic uh, space and and facilitation. You know, we come from a, even though we're a company, my program's a company, um, we work for, with multiple bottom lines and proper, a prop, profit has never been a thing. You know, most of my income comes from facilitating and everything else I just reinvest in the program, you know? So like profit's never been our primary motivator, but we do have to keep the lights on, you know? And so we pay attention to finances and have budgets and all of that stuff. Um, so I just want to name that piece that, um, I get it. I get the entitlement that wealthy people have. Um, and I, in some opportunities in connect, connecting with people on the regulatory side of the Natural Medicine Health Act who want to build, create programs around it, like uh, I've been ghosted. Um, I've been ignored, you know, to seek guidance and support from the people who are leaders in the program. I totally get it, you know. On the other side of that, I think there's um, because of the big energy and the big emotions within the natural medicine community, the psychedelic community, um, it would be hard for anybody to navigate, engage a dialogue in this space. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say other than, yes, there will be negative corporate players. 
Um, but I believe that the psychedelic community will be able to call that out, check it, and the worst players will not succeed in this movement. So that's that's the regulatory side. It uh, it starts with psilocybin, but it allows for the future possibilities of DMT um, and, and uh, non peyote mescaline and ibogaine. Um, well, that can be another conversation about these other medicines. On the personal use side, there's been some misunderstanding um, about what the personal use side actually does, and the language is ambiguous, but from my understanding with the legal language is that it was intentionally ambiguous. It was as good as they could get it um, in regards to the, um, the actual language around some of the issues around being an underground practitioner and a guide, you know, like it's a really complicated issue. And I also want to point out, I believe, activists on the natural medicine health side of it have did did engage the community to some degree and that it is in there you know it, is it perfect probably not i can see other areas that it could be uh, stronger um, and clearer but i think it was intentional and they did the best they could um, so on the personal use side even though on the regulated side, it only starts with psilocybin on the personal use side. Once this is enacted and signed by uh, the governor, it legalizes the personal use of these five medicines, psilocybin, psilocin, which are in um, mushrooms, DMT, uh, which is in ayahuasca, non peyote mescaline, which is very appropriate to prohibit the use of peyote that's a native american church thing out of respect of the indigenous community it's a, like an established norm within the decrim movement to not include peyote um in in this in these practices but it does allow for mescaline um probably san pedro would be the primary medicine there um and then the last one is ibogaine right and so iboga and i personally wouldn't be using that in the personal use setting period um because of the intensity of the medicine and how it's used and things like that. But I believe there are ways to even use that medicine safely. It's just not something I have a lot of experience with. Um, so it'll, it, it completely legalizes these medicines. You just can't sell it, sell these medicines. Um, the other thing, so, so I want to read a, just some of the things that it does that legalizes it is it's, it legalizes possessing, storing, using, processing, transporting purchasing obtaining and ingesting so it legalizes all of these things um what it what it doesn't say here is manufacturing you know so there is some concerns by some people of synthetic medicines that's not happen on the regulated side but we're years away from the manufacturing of of psychedelic um, chemicals medicines um, it, these are going to be naturally extracted processing uh, is allowed which means that things can be extracted um, so mimosa hostilis can be used to extract DMT, for example. I don't know how mescaline could be extracted from San Pedro, but um, I'm sure there's ways to do it. That's legal. Even making um, psychedelic mushroom chocolates, things like that, totally legal. All under the personal use side. You can buy it technically, but you can't sell it legally. All right. So... Um, so it's very clear that you can't sell it and it does block loopholes of giving the medicine away and selling services around some of it and all of that, you know. Um, so another other areas that it does do is use of psychedelic medicine, these medicines, these natural medicines can affect your occupational license. Uh, so like doctors, lawyers, um, nurses, as far as I can tell, mental health practitioners, you know, private use isn't going to affect yours and there's going to be a lot of um debate around this and there's um uh licensing organizations or credentialing organizations that are private that are going to have some real so strong solid says on this stuff but um they're you know that's going to be a legal question um it can't prohibit uh mental health services from getting mental health services or addiction counseling um your property is safe if it's used for medicine uh, experiences you can share the medicine for counseling, spiritual guidance, beneficial community-based practices, supported use. 
Also, as a parent, these are some important for me, um, uh, protects parents that personal use can't by itself be considered child abuse or neglect. And so that might also in, um, in situations where families are, or couples are divorcing, it can't be used as leverage. If one of them is a psychedelic medicine user, it can't be used as leverage to take your kids away. You can't restrict visitation rights and it also expunges records. So these are all really, really great things. Um, let's see, uh, can't prohibit organ transplants and can't prohibit, or it can't penalize parole or probation. Um, and it can't be used as a basis of search. So if I have like a mushroom on me, it can't be used to search my house or something like that. Um, all of this is really great stuff. And I think it's um, just these reasons are significant on the personal use side. Now, some of the ambiguous language is associated with, um, can I facilitate with these medicines um, as a, on the personal use side? And I've read it, I've reviewed it, I've gotten sought legal support, I've gotten into arguments with lawyers about it just to clarify the language. It can't, what it can do, what it does is it prohibits a person from using paid advertising to offer their services. You can't pay for advertising because that goes into commercial use. Uh, but you can't have a website. And um, there's nothing that prohibits a medicine practitioner from gifting the medicine to a client and then providing services um, with the client while they're on the medicine. So it totally legalizes psychedelic guiding. Um, now there's debate on how that will play out. And there's some questions around Dora um, coming in and trying to regulate that. I have some some things I'll, I'll share about that because I think it's those are legitimate concerns. Um, but Dora is not going to have any regulations for at least a year or more um, after the personal use comes in. So there's this window to establish best practices within the psychedelic community um, to keep us safe. All right. And also an unusual side effect of this bill, which I don't or act that I don't think people are really paying attention to is because it eliminates the stigma of psychedelic medicines, at least from a legal perspective, but protects participants, um, you know, and their property and their children and, and, and their licenses. It actually creates an incentive to be advocates for accountability and safety within the psychedelic community. So there's this unspoken rule in the psychedelic community, which is broken pretty regularly <laughs> also. And that is you can't, don't use a person's psychedelic medicine experience as leverage in a conflict that's not directly related to the medicine experience. Um, so there's a lot of fear in our community around being outed because of the professional or being a parent or any of that stuff. But if those, if those leverage or pain points or pressure points are put are out of the window, then if somebody's being unethical within this community side, this personal use side as a facilitator, then a lot of the constraints of saying something are um, to protect others from a person's practice or inappropriate practice go away. It actually increases the protections of the psychedelic community just because there's no longer as many legal constraints of outing someone it, uh, and who is being uh, unethical, inappropriate, dangerous, that sort of thing. All right, so I think that's a big thing to name. Um, so there has been some question. Okay, so can Dora take over this situation, regulate the personal use side? And um, maybe they'll try. You know, again, Dora isn't the best organization on the planet. It's bureaucratic. It's very mainstream, controlling, punitive for the psychotherapists in the world. Um, I guess a couple of things I just want to name in that regard, though. So because of my program, we've had to look at this um, significantly, and we've engaged Dora um, a few times now, um, and we've been able to engage them in a way that protects the, our non-licensed practitioners. It's all about disclosure and accountability, um, but we have engaged Dora in a way that uh, allows our non-licensed counselors to ethically practice. 
Again, I'm not going to go into our protocol here, but it is the thing that we we do. Okay, um, so it is possible to engage Dora in a good way. The other thing th uh, that people may not realize is that in Dora regulations now, under the under psychotherapy regulations, there are explicit prohib pro prohibits um, prohibitions of Dora. Uh, going after someone for their religious practice. All right. So um, there are there are ministers who practice spiritual counseling, for an example. And so the question, in, you know, ministers have a First Amendment right uh, to their religion, and we all do. Um, and that it's generally organized under churches, but there's a lot of ways to create churches in our society and medicine and indigenous medicine practitioners in particular often have uh, licensed churches, registered churches um, that allow for that and support that. So there are specific prohibitions within the regulations already that will block Dora from going after religious practitioners in general, not even if not even medicine related. But again, there is a way to protect the indigenous communities from Dora specifically. Um, and that this is what regulation looks like. This is what get coming out of um, coming out of the underground will look like is to be able to um, put things within a container um, that at least will block Dora from engaging um, someone. OK, I, I don't have any concerns because of my experiences with Dora and the religious protections that are already in the regulations. Um, so. Let's be mindful of the fear associated with oh, Dora is just going to take over everything. Um, now there will there might be lawsuits. Um, the, I expect the regulatory side to uh, there's going to be lawsuits. Do people are going to sue Dora over this? These corporate interests might do that if the regulations get too extreme, you know. And then on the on the um, the personal use side, right? They're, the extreme situations are the ones that push the edges of legality um, in really significant ways, like charging $100 for your favorite 50 friends to come to your psilocybin mushroom party and then giving away mushrooms. You know, that's those are gonna be some edges um, that might um, be challenged, all right? So it's not a free pass to do anything you want with these medicines. Um, but typically, I would say that the, the legal issues are going to come when people get hurt. And so if you set up proper safety guidelines, you're private with your friends. Um, I don't see many issues coming in with that. Like it's going to be established. Colorado in a good way is a purple state and likes regulations, but is also in many ways, at least in a lot of places as, um, you know, progressive. Um, so <clears throat> there's a couple of, so the per, the door religious use, I think is a, is something that we wanted to, we want to address. And maybe there's going to be some factual debate about what I'm saying. Again, I'm just sharing my perspective. There's a couple of things, though, that I want to name out the decrim side is saying that I don't agree with. Um, and it almost as if at this point they're trying to just win in some ways. And I don't think this is congruent with the psychedelic community in general. So a couple of things I want to name. One is the uh, localities concern um, in the in the bill, in the act, it says um, a locality can't prohibit someone from using these medicines in their area, you know, so that, you know, it's going to be more about retreat centers and, and clinics and things. They're going to be ways localities can block or contain or um, even prohibit. I, I would suspect there might be some areas that and there might be have to be, again, lawsuits and things that will block them from or, uh, you know, at least attempting to open up areas of the of the state. A couple of things I just want to name here. You know what? Like, I don't want to work f from a super conservative, unwelcoming space. Why would I even want to go into a location like that? It's not that special. You're not that special. I, I'm not that interested in engaging in that way. There's going to be plenty of places to do this work. I think the, the question, though, then becomes personal use, right? And it is totally appropriate 
to prohibit a county from blocking personal use. Um, and that there, it's a it's a drug war trope to say that if this passes, all the druggies are going to come into your community because of it. That's just not true with psychedelic medicines. And that's a drug war trope. Um, it's, it's a racist trope. Let's move on from, from that one. Um, I think it's really important to name that piece that we can't use drug war tropes to um, go after people who are trying to legalize psychedelic cannabis or psychedelic medicines in general. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The other question I'm seeing more recently, which I just want to name is this, the argument goes, this will allow for synthetic DMT manufacturing. Synthetic DMT can be put in a vape pen that's indistinguishable from cannabis or tobacco vape, vape pens. It can be used to uh, harm other people. All right. Um, so first of all, synthetic DMT was proven safe by Rick Strassman over 30 years ago. And these studies were safety studies using synthetic pure uh, pharmaceutical grade DMT. And it is um, very safe physiologically, even psychologically in the right containers and everything. Rick Strassman, who started the psychedelic renaissance, broke the prohibition of legalization by proving DMT was safe um, as a medicine. And synthetic DMT is going to be safer than whatever is extracted in someone's um, kitchen with petrochemicals, you know. But again, the regulation does not allow for the manufacturing of synthetic medicines yet. It might be several years down the road, starting maybe with psilocybin and then maybe DMT, that synthetics will come into the um, program, but they're going to be really restricted. So that leaves the question of like safety around vape pens and things like that. And so again, we need to come from a psych a already established psychedelic harm reduction um, worldview here and say, don't share a vape pen with anybody you don't know, whether it's tobacco, cannabis, or DMT or whatever. Um, just don't do it. Don't share vape pens with people you don't know that well, even if you like them and you just met them and whatever, like you're more way more likely to get COVID um, at this point than anything else harm you. And um, just don't do it like like this has nothing to do with the law. People are already smoking DMT at parties with friends and things like that and vape pens. It's not even synthetic. It's extracted DMT. This is just not a, a issue that should be brought up. And, you know, I think it's bad faith to call out DMT as a problem from a medicine community perspective. Uh, it doesn't fit. Um, and I know Rick Strassman. Um, and uh, I really value his contributions to the movement. And if I were given the opportunity to facilitate with psilocybin or synthetic DMT in Colorado, uh, yes, please, we're going to work towards that with this. Um, I don't, for those of you who don't know my extended state DMT program, yes, please, like this is a good news situation to eventually allow for synthetic DMT in contained settings in Colorado. Um, it's not going to be like mass produced or anything like that. Uh, there's only so much, so many people interested in this work. Um, yes, it's going to increase tourism. It's going to increase revenue in Colorado and that sort of thing. You know, so like, um, I just want to be an advocate for, for DMT right now. I don't, I don't, uh, think it's, um, a good faith conversation to say, you can't do this because it'll legalize DMT. It'll legalize extracted DMT. Um, you can't sell it. Uh, you might not even be able to get the materials generally to do it. Um, and synthetic DMT is going to be way cleaner than anything extracted with petrochemicals in someone's kitchen. So, so the decrim side kind of lost me on some of these points that they're uh, concerned about and the naming their concerns about. Uh, also, the question of like it will allow for the abuse of peyote, it explicitly prohibits the use of an abuse of peyote. Uh, and as far as I understand, I don't even think peyote naturally grows in Colorado. Um, 
and that it was specifically this language was specifically put in to the bill based on indigenous um, conversations, even though I get it like there are indigenous communities that don't have a voice in this I totally get it like yes, this is a capitalistic society, yes, we are not the best at inclusivity and diversity and as in points of views. Um, but with the door prohibition against uh, regulating religious practices, the blocking of the use of peyote, that's as good as I think it can get in this situation. So, <clears throat> so I just want to name a couple of other things again, man, like, I hope I'm not going to get hate mail or anything like that. I'm not interested in engaging those conversations, but I am going to put this on YouTube uh, so I can share with my community. Use the comment box, ask questions about specifics of the bill. I can answer them. I can point you to the language one way or the other. And I, I might totally disagree with some of the aspects of the bill or the act, excuse me. Um, but put the, put questions in there, put misunderstandings, something you're curious about. If you're on the fence, um, then let me know and maybe I can address your concerns, okay? So I wanna to talk to a little bit about why I'm voting for it, um, even with my concerns that I do have on the corporate space. Um, and I also want to just reiterate, like, if you don't vote for this or if you don't vote um, either way, uh, you got to vote. Uh, this is a really big election, historic um, choices on the line, democracies on the line, environmental protections are on the line. Um, I mean, it could get pretty bad if the wrong people get into power and we don't have time to to put up with that. So at the very least, please, everybody, anybody in the natural medicine community, the psychedelic community who generally doesn't vote, you're obligated to vote on this one. All right. So or vote in this election. Now, whether or not you vote, I, I hope it passes. Uh, and I'm going to tell everybody in my community, you should vote for this. Um, we can use these skills or these um, regulations to thrive in as psychedelic medicine practitioners. A lot of people have expressed concerns around cannabis using uh, uh, not being the greatest industry, you know, how we regulated cannabis in Colorado is a bad thing. Corporations came in. Oh, that's true. Colorado is way better than other states in the legalization of cannabis. I, I know this for a fact. Um, and the other thing is, even with all the bullshit and the corporate interests and everything, my program as a psychedelic organization has been able to thrive within the regulations as they are with cannabis, provide therapeutic support to thousands of people, profound, incredible healing. So even if the corporate interests come in to the natural medicine, I just want people to know that there are a lot of activists, myself included, a lot of practitioners in this area already who will hold these people accountable, who will say something if we see unethical practices, if we see something that's extractive, if we see somebody saying, oh, you should take psilocybin every week so I can make money off of you, we're going to call them out. Um, I'm obligated, I think, ethically to say something. And I know a lot of people are. And there are a lot of really great community people in who are activists, who are professionals, who are already organizing around this um, to have a voice in this space. Um, you know, and as far as corporate aligned or pharmaceutical companies, ph major pharmaceutical companies have to wait for federal legalization. There's no way they're going to be able to engage this on a state level. I just know, I just know the business side of this enough to know that. That, does, that doesn't mean there won't be like pharmaceutical players or, or like venture capitalists coming in and things like that. I also believe that there's a lot of good, well-meaning people who identify as like wealthy or um, entitled, <laughs> uh, and that they're good people in, on this side. I, I know some of these people, um, and I can speak for them um, in a good way that I think they're really well intended. 
Um, so it's not a black and white issue, even if you're wealthy and you gave money to this program. There's nobody, there's no Compass Pathways or some of the big players. They're against this bill because they're going the FDA route and legalization of psilocybin as a, as a tool, as a therapeutic tool. MDMA is a therapeutic tool. They're against this. The major psychedelic corporations in some ways are against it. Also, just this idea of this take corporate takeover uh, hitting the community because of this, that's like old news. Um, if you look at the boards of a lot of the major um, nonprofits and other organizations, look at local universities here that are engaged in psychedelic training, other boards of other universities engaged in psychedelic training, the corporate perspective is already well established on these programs um, and that it's time to have a voice and a counter voice to it you know so the, the another thing i'd like to say with corporate practices it's just not going to work um, the piece underlying fundamentally that i go back to over and over and over and over again and i think this will ring true to a lot of people who sit with it is i trust the medicine I trust these medicines. It's not like taking a pill where you just feel better or whatever. It shows you where you're out of alignment. And if and it and it's not just a personal thing too. It shows organizations where they're out of alignment. Um there's very little um exam very few examples of corporations doing well in the psychedelic field already. Like there's no evidence that will prove that a company can use these medicines in an extractive way and then be successful. It's just, and, and as a facilitator and I, like, a, I, okay, so I think I wrote it down here. I have 19 psychedelic guides, including myself on my teams, 19. I have a little bit of experience of what it's like to be a psychedelic guide in a professional sense where you, where you're, as a job, you're required to do this work over and over again. It's hard. It stirs up things. And if if there's if a if a facilitator's not getting paid enough or required to do more journeys than they're than them they're able to engage facilitate safely, um, it's not going to work. They're going to the, there's going to be a huge burnout in these spaces, and there's also going to be um, you know uh, emotional dynamics within the communities that will crash these programs. Um, the other thing I want to name in this context is why are we giving our power away to corporate interest as psychedelic facilitators? Who are they going to train? Who are they going to hire for these but us? And why can't we unionize? Why can't we have pro collective professional voices and say no to the to the trends that are not conducive to the therapy, you know, the the ethical use of these medicines? Again, you know, okay, then you say race to the bottom, somebody's going to do it. Yeah, and they're going to burn out. And then the people who are unskilled in this, there are mechanisms within the regulations that um, require reporting and the people who have the worst outcomes, it's going to show up in the um, reporting and it's going to be traced right back to these people. Um, so. I don't want you to think like we're giving our power away uh, as a psychedelic community by this passing. We are on top of this. We are as a community are empowered. We just have to organize now. So our program is going to do everything we can to organize around this. But um, I would just like to invite any local community who's already organized uh, practitioners, communities of practitioners, other centers organize um have a collective voice and as a worker unionize um find your collective voice and and don't put up with it don't put up with bs okay <clears throat> so i already mentioned the that it, uh, the other on the on the personal use side when you remove the stigma it actually increases community accountability without requiring any regulations whatsoever the bad actors on both sides of this equation are going to be the first to be called out. And you got to wonder if there are certain people who are 
being the loudest around this work um, and to, to vote no, like are, are some of them actually not wanting the accountability that this provides? Again, I also get that there's a significant amount of trauma within our community caused by prohibition, the war on drugs, just say no campaign, and just the act of legalization is really a big deal for us to emotionally process. Contracts, rules, all of these things are very foreign to many people in our community, and I get that. Um, but it's time to like look under the emotions and see what's really there. So I want to end with just a couple of things and other reasons that are more personal uh, why I'm voting for this and why I recommend that other people vote for this. Even, again, not taking sides, I am recommending people vote for this act. Um, so when do I want to say first? So I was in ceremony. This was a little while ago. I was in a cannabis ceremony. Had 50 people at it. Uh, online across the country, the world, in in my uh, space here, um, it was a big deal. It was really special, and I asked for guidance about this Natural Medicine Health Act. And as I said, maybe at the beginning of this, is that this is an existential um, situation for our program. You know, like a lot of unknowns, a lot of uncertainty, lots of risk, all of the above, um, and. What came to me was, I want other people to experience what I've experienced. I have practiced for nine years plus as a psychedelic facilitator using illegal natural medicine, cannabis sativa, and I have witnessed things that I did not believe possible. I have healed in ways myself that are not technically possible. I've seen miracles over and over again in some of the most deeply meaningful spiritual experiences I bear witness to um, so many times. It's impossible to describe. I wish that for you. And to do that in a way that doesn't require you to risk going to jail. There's something really amazing and beautiful. And if that means all of a sudden overnight, I have a thousand quote competitors in this space. So be it. What a blessing. A thousand other people who couldn't do this um, before this bill passed. I wish that for you. I wish my experience for you. What the stories I've heard from my team, I wish that for you. It doesn't mean I say go out and do it, go out and do psilocybin with, you know, without in uncontained spaces. Absolutely not. I'm saying we have a cont contained space that's safe, protected, legal, uh, licensed counselors can do the work we do, and ministers and spiritual practitioners. All of us are doing the work. I really wish that for you. Uh, that's just deeply personal. It's so beyond business, uh, uh, you know, agendas, anything like that. I wish that for you. The other thing I just want to say personally is, um, and I, I have, I feel ethically obligated at this point to say things like this because of the power of, of healing that I've seen. Um, earlier this year in January, my father passed away. It was really sad. It was terrible. I don't, you know, like this is a real normal human experience, but it was, it was hard. And I love my dad very much. He died of cancer and the medicines they were giving him kind of messed up his head, his cognition. He was in a hard space. He um, was trying to process things that the, again, the chemo that he was on was prohibiting him from fully engaging clearly. Um, his cognition was um, messed up from the drugs, I think. Also, Emotionally, he was dying. He uh, was, I don't know, scared was the right word. Um, struggling emotionally, angry a lot of the time and deeply struggling. Didn't have much he could hold on to. And because of his cognition decline, um, because of the medication, he couldn't figure things out clearly. He could have died that way in, in deep despair without 
reconnecting with my family. Um, I brought him some psilocybin mushrooms and some cannabis medicines to help him. And even though he wasn't in a space to do a full journey experience, we microdosed together psilocybin low dose like 25 milligrams like a fourth of a microdose um and it was really impactful um the cannabis game changer um he pulled out of the impaired cognition he could think clearly again he was able to process um the big emotional experiences that he was at the end of his life that he needed to process he reconnected with his family. He told stories. He told jokes. He connected with his grandchildren again. Um, he laughed and he died peacefully. And I'll do it again in a second. I'd break the law in a second for, for that outcome. I believe it saved my father's soul. I was right there with him at the end. I wish that for others. And there are people in the world that won't break the law, even if they know that this will this will help them. It was such a night and day experience. It was so different than what could have happened that I am ethically obligated to say something. And if this bill, this act, only did that one thing, even with all the issues, it will legalize microdosing, grow your own mushrooms, uh, help your family, who's struggling. If it just did that one thing with all the baggage, I am a hundred percent yes to this. So. I wish that for you. I wish that for you. I wish that for everybody to have that, you know, to be able to transform a struggle at that core it's that soul level struggle to something that was beautiful. So um, <clears throat> in closing, I just want to say one last thing. Um, so the regulation side of this with Dora and everything, there's no guarantees it's going to work out well. There's going to be glitches. There's going to be fights. There's going to be all kinds of battles. There might even be lawsuits. It's going to be at least a year or two before all the regulations happen. We're going to, as an organization, we're going to go through all of that. Um, we're going to uh, apply to become a healing center. We're going to apply to become a training program. Again, we already meet all of the criteria for it, just not with psilocybin specifically. So you're going to have a voice. There's going to be good people on these boards these uh advisory boards and other things i know the people who who are being recruited for some of you know these advisory board, board positions we're going to do everything we can to say this be active in it and and my activism is still my work i'm just going to do my work on the uh personal use side as an organization we have a nonprofit. we have um it's a religious nonprofit. uh we're going to immediately begin providing education and harm reduction services to our community to support safe use practices in personal context for our community uh, we already know how to do it we just need to develop the content and the container to do it safely and appropriately so as soon as this legalizes we want you to know that even though there's like a lot of like concern around like no regulations on the personal use side that we as an organization commit to education, safety, harm reduction, and providing services to our community so that those who choose to take the medicines in a personal use setting can do so safely and confidently with their friends. We have codes of ethics already developed. We have policies and procedures for safety purposes that don't take away from the experience. Um, but we're gonna we're as an activism we're gonna we're gonna step into this. Um, I think per personally, what I've landed on is um, because I've benefited for the last nine years working with cannabis as a psychedelic, while other people are still going to jail. Um, this is my my service. This is me 
saying, okay, thank you so much for the opportunity I have had. And I want you all to know um, I'm stepping into the activism, the community organizing and stepping into working um, around these other medicines uh, to keep our community safe as possible, to be an active player in that space. So that's all I have for now, my friends. Um, please pardon the rough edges around this. Uh, leave any comments below. I'll do another one of these if it's helpful to answer your questions, but we just got, um, we just got the ballot in the mail. It's time to vote. And I would strongly encourage you if you're on the fence and you've heard a lot of things that you're concerned about, uh, I hope I've been able to, uh, uh, reduce some of those concerns from my perspective, not taking sides and that you vote for this. Regardless of your choices with this act, please vote uh, in general. Uh, we're all obligated to vote in 2022. So many blessings, my friends, as always, safe travels, and I look forward to continuing the conversation with you.